The listening part of the occupational English test has three parts, and in each part you hear a number of different extracts. At the beginning of the test, you will hear a beep sound. You have time to read the questions before you hear the extracts. You will hear each extract only once. You have to complete your answers as you listen. At the end of each test, you will be given two minutes to check answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to his patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1, questions 1 to 12. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Hiramichi. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. What's your problem? Well, doctor, I feel like suffocating whenever I lie flat on my back. I have noticed that whenever I would recline backwards, I get this feeling and the problem has worsened recently. I'm now sleeping in an upright position. What's your age? 54, doctor. You had any surgeries earlier? No, doctor. Do you get chest pain? No, doctor. I get frequent urination and shortness of breath. Do you have any sort of bleeding disorder? No, doctor. Have you suffered or are you suffering with any other diseases? Yes, I have type 2 diabetes mellitus, hypertension, asthma, and high cholesterol. May I know if there is any family history of diseases? Well, my brothers had prostate cancer and my father had brain cancer. My brothers and sister have diabetes. Okay, what medications are you taking? I am taking glipizide, uh, 5 milligrams twice a day, metformin, 500 milligrams twice a day, Atticand, 16 milligrams daily, metoprolol, 25 milligrams twice daily, Lipitor, 10 milligrams daily, pantoprazole, 40 milligrams daily, Flomax, uh, 0.4 milligrams daily, Detrol, 4 milligrams daily, Zyrtec 10 milligrams daily, Adverdiscus 100 over 50 micrograms, uh, one puff twice a day, and uh, Fluticasone spray 50 micrograms, two sprays daily. Are you allergic to any medication? No, doctor. Extract 2 questions 13 to 24. You hear a physician talking to a patient called Mackenzie. For questions 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, doctor. Good morning. Uh, have your seat. What's your problem? Well, I have a two-year history of small cell lung cancer that has metastasized in both femurs, lower lumbar spine, and pelvis. I had numerous chemotherapy and radiation treatments and just completed a series of 10 radiation treatments for pain relief. But I have persistent pain symptoms, mostly in my low back, and on the right side radiating down the back of my right leg to knee. I have some numbness in the bottom of my left foot and some throbbing pain in the left foot at times. The pain worsens with prolonged sitting in a car, walking, or standing. 
Well, what is your age? I'm 45, doctor. You had any surgery? Yes, a chest port placement. What medications are you taking now? Duragesic patch, 250 micrograms total. Celebrex, 200 milligrams once daily. Iron, 240 milligrams twice daily. Paxil, 20 milligrams daily. Neurotonin, 300 milligrams three times daily. And Percocet. I am also having Warfarin, one milligram daily to keep my chest port patent. Do you drink or smoke? Yes, I smoke one pack a day, and it has been the same habit for about 30 years, and I drink beer approximately twice a day. Don't know when I started that. Well, the neurological examinations show that reflexes are 2 plus in both knees and absent at both ankles. Sensations are decreased uh, distally in the left foot, otherwise intact to pinprick. Examination of your lumbar spine shows normal lumbar lordosis with fairly functional range of movement. There's a significant tenderness at your lower back lumbar facet and sacroiliac joints uh, that seem to reproduce a lot of your low back and right leg complaints. The multiple scan reports reveal that abnormal uptake involving the femurs bilaterally. You have increased uptake in the sacroiliac joint regions bilaterally. MRI of the lower hip joints shows heterogeneous bone marrow signal in both proximal femurs. Pelvis CT shows a trabecular pattern with healed metastases. CT of the orbits reveal a small amount of fluid in the mastoid air cells on the right. You have small cell lung cancer with metastasis at the lower lumbar spine, pelvis, and both femurs. Symptomatic facet and sacroiliac joint syndrome on the right and chronic pain syndrome. Peripheral neuropathy of your left foot is probably secondary to the chemo and radiation treatments. I will plan on injecting your right sacroiliac and facet joints under fluoroscopy today. If the pain is persistent even after this injection, you can take an extra 50 microgram patch and take a couple of extra Percocet if needed. From now you stop taking Paxil and I am planning to start Cymbalta instead. That is the end for Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the best answer, A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at the question 25. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about different types of breath sounds. Now read the question. Hello doctor, can you explain what are the different types of breath sounds? Well, there are several distinct types of abnormal breath sounds. Crackles, also called rails, tend to sound like discontinuous clicking. Bubbling or rattling when the person inhales, uh, crackling breath sounds may sound dry or wet, and physicians might describe them as either coarse or fine. Stridor is a high-pitched, harsh, wheeze-like sound that occurs while breathing in people with a blocked upper airway. Wheezing noises are high-pitched and persistent that may sound like a breathy whistle. At times, wheezing can be loud enough to hear even without a stethoscope. A short version of a wheeze, called a squawk, occurs during inhalation. Ronky are persistent, lower-pitched, rough sounds similar to snoring. Question 26. You hear a monologue by a physician explaining about Heberdeen's nodes. Now read the question.
The bony growths that develop on the finger joints are called Heberden's nodes, or interphalangeal joints. Mostly, Heberden's nodes develop on the joints nearest to the fingertips, causing the fingers to appear crooked. They only develop in osteoarthritis patients. Each joint in our body has a layer of cartilage to protect the bones. Osteoarthritis causes the cartilage layer to degrade, gradually allowing the bones and the joints contact directly with each other. Over time, the bones get damaged from scraping together. Our body reacts to this body damage by developing new bones that are known as nodes. Heberdine's nodes are one of such bone formations on the fingers of patients with severe osteoarthritis. Question 27. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about surgical treatments for patients with a desiccated disc. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the surgical treatments for patients with a desiccated disc? There are many different surgical treatments for a desiccated disc. In the method called fusion, the vertebrae surrounding the desiccated disc will be joined together to stabilize the back and prevent movement that will worsen pain causing discomfort. In the decompression method, the extra bone or a disc material that has moved out of place is removed to make more room for the spinal nerves. In the correction method, the surgeon will make the necessary repairs to correct an abnormal curvature of the spine to relieve pain and increase range of motion. In the implant method, artificial discs, or spacers, will be placed in between vertebrae to prevent the bones from rubbing. Question 28. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about outcomes of TB skin test. Now read the question. Doctor, can you explain to me the outcomes of a TB skin test? Well, the outcomes for TB skin tests are not always clear-cut. The main consideration in a TB test is the size of the bump on the arm. If the bump is smaller than 5 millimeters, then the test result is considered negative to TB. In a case where the test bump is larger than 5 millimeters, then the test result is considered positive. But we have to be very cautious about false positive and false negative. At times, Patients vaccinated against TB using the Bacillus calmet garin can show a false positive result for TB. There is also a possibility that when the patient's infected with bacteria similar to TB, false negative result happens when a person has a weak immune system or has been exposed to pathogens, such as smallpox or measles. Patients infected with TB very recently and very old TB patients can also show false negative test results. You hear a monologue by a physician explaining about atelectasis. Now read the question. A partial or complete collapse of one or both the lungs is called atelectasis. That occurs when tiny air sacs in the lungs called alveoli deflate. The collapse of the lowest lobes in both the lungs is called bibasilar atelectasis. The lobes of the lungs are filled with millions of tiny sacs called alveoli, which are arranged in clusters and surrounded by blood vessels. When a person breathes, the alveoli allow their blood to collect oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. During bibasilar atelectasis, the alveoli in the lower lobes of the lungs deflate and stop performing this crucial task, therefore blocking oxygen from reaching the vital organs, life-threatening at times. Question 
Question 30. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about liver flukes. Now read the question. Doctor, what are liver flukes? Liver flukes is a parasite disease. A patient may never know he has liver flukes. Even the doctors at times may not diagnose the condition because the symptoms of fasciolysis are similar to many other conditions. There are chances that a person with liver flukes living may never develop fasciolysis. Others may develop fasciolysis many years after the liver flukes entered the body. A person cannot transmit liver flukes accidentally to someone else unlike other parasite diseases. Liver flukes make their way from the intestines to the liver once it enters the body. To get into the liver, the liver flukes must burrow through the lining of the liver causing pain in the upper right abdomen. The two types of liver flukes that can affect people are fasciola hepatica and fasciola gigantica. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the best answer, A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at Extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear the lecture given by a physician on the topic of cystic hygromas. You have 90 seconds to read the questions 31 to 36. Cystic hygromas are fluid-filled sacs that commonly occur on the neck or head of a baby as a result of blockages in lymphatic system. At times, cystic hygromas are detected through ultrasounds during pregnancy. Some cystic hygromas may not appear until the child grows. Cystic hygromas affect 1 in 800 pregnancies and 1 in 8,000 live births. In 80% of cases, cystic hygromas appear on the face including the neck, head, cheek, mouth, or tongue. It can usually grow in other parts of the body, including the chest, armpits, buttocks, legs, and groin. Usually cystic hygromas that are present at birth or develop after birth are benign. However, they can be disfiguring, glow very large, and affect a child's ability to swallow and breathe. At times, Cystic hygromas detected during pregnancy go away before birth. A fetal cystic hygroma can be a risk factor for miscarriage. Although usually cystic hygromas affect children, there are rare cases of their appearance in adults. In a remarkable case, a 32-year-old man had a cystic hygroma on his neck that appeared eight months before diagnosis. He was experiencing severe pain and swelling in the right lower part of his face that extended to his neck. Biopsy confirmed it was an adult-onset cystic hygroma. Environmental and genetic factors caused the formation of cystic hygromas, mainly viral infections transmitted to a fetus during pregnancy or drug and alcohol consumption during pregnancy 
are the causes for cystic hygroma formation. However, most of the cystic hygromas are due to genetic conditions, especially due to chromosomal abnormalities accounted for in 50% of the cases. Genetic causes for cystic hygroma are Turner syndrome is a condition where a woman is partially or completely missing an X chromosome, causing change in appearance and problems related to the fertility and heart. Patients with Noonan syndrome may have unusual facial features, bleeding problems, heart issues, short stature, skeletal abnormalities, and many other symptoms. Trisomy 13, 18, or 21. These conditions cause the embryo to develop an additional set of chromosomes that produce a variety of congenital abnormalities, including intellectual disability. Depending on the location of the cysts, the symptoms of a cystic hygroma may vary. Some children may not even experience any symptoms other than its growth. The most common method of diagnosing cystic hygromas is ultrasound imaging. Usually cystic hygromas are diagnosed when the fetus is still in the womb during a routine abdominal ultrasound. It is also detected in a blood test carried out at 15 to 20 weeks. If the blood test result shows high levels of alpha fetoproteins, it might be an indication of cystic hygroma. Although ultrasound images may indicate the possible location and size of a cystic hygroma, additional diagnosis may be required for obtaining more information such as depth and severity of the growth and any obstructions that can indicate a breathing problem. A transvaginal probe method can take better images of the cystic hygroma without the obstruction of other organs in the way. Fast spin magnetic resonance imaging can provide a clear image and more details about the cystic hygroma. During amniocentesis test, a doctor will collect amniotic fluid through a special needle for testing chromosomal abnormalities. Normally, there is no need for any treatment for a cystic hygroma, as long as it is not causing any health issues. Sclerotherapy is one treatment option, in which a specialist injects a chemotherapeutic agent called bleomycin into the cystic hygroma to shrink its growth. However, it may take several therapy sessions for this to happen. Moreover, a cystic hygroma can also grow back. A surgical removal of cystic hygroma may be considered only when the child grows a bit older. However, surgery can cause significant scarring and complications such as damage to nerves, arteries, blood vessels, and structures near the cystic hygroma. In case the cystic hygromas have associations with other genetic conditions that may impact the development of the child, cystic hygromas can grow back even after surgery, treatment, especially if the cyst cannot be removed completely during the pregnancy. Now look at extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You hear the monologue of a physician giving a lecture on delusions of grandeur and its treatments. You have 90 seconds to read the questions 37 through 42. Well, a delusion of grandeur is an unusual or false belief about one's greatness. For instance, a person with this condition may believe that he is famous, can end world wars, or that they can be immortal. Delusions of grandeur, also known as grandiose delusions, often accompany other mental health symptoms. They may be linked to physical or mental health conditions, such as schizophrenia, 
bipolar disorder, or certain types of dementia. The condition may be persistent, or it may appear only periodically. Certain people with delusions of grandeur also experience other delusions, like an unusual religious belief or a fear of persecution. However, a delusion of grandeur is more than just very high self-esteem or an inflated sense of self-importance. It marks a remarkable detachment from the practical world. A person with this condition may continue to believe in his delusion despite contradictory evidence. Delusions of grandeur come in many forms. Many people experience a similar theme over time. Schizophrenia is a mental health condition that causes delusions, hallucinations, and false beliefs. Bipolar is a mental condition classified by periods of depression, followed by periods of mania. During times of mania, a patient may have a highly inflated sense of self, which can manifest as a delusion of grandeur. During a manic episode, a person with bipolar may tend to spend too much money, have trouble sleeping, appear very hyper, or behave aggressively. Narcissistic Personality Disorder In most mental conditions, patients with a similar condition can have very different personalities. Personality disorders directly affect the personality, fundamentally altering how a person relates to others and themselves. People with narcissistic personality disorder have a very high inflated sense of their own importance. They seek flattery and validation, believe themselves to be extraordinary and unique, and lack empathy. A person with narcissistic personality disorder may have a sense of entitlement that leads them to act in ways in order to obtain admiration and special privileges that is objectionable to others. Most people consider dementia, including Alzheimer, a memory impairment, yet dementia slowly reduces a person's ability to think clearly. It can affect the way we interact with the world, plan, and think. As dementia progresses, some patients develop delusions, including delusions of grandeur. Dementia patients with delusions of grandeur typically have many other symptoms, including significant memory issues. Damage or injury to the brain can also change the way people think at times, potentially causing delusions. Brain injuries may also cause hallucinations, personality changes, memory problems, and difficulties with basic skills, such as reading. Attending group therapy may help the patient to build healthier relationships with others. Treatment for delusions of grandeur is very difficult, since the patients may feel these delusions are good to them and truly believe in their delusions. They often resist treatments. Often, antipsychotic drugs are helpful in treating delusions due to many causes. Patients with bipolar may need to take drugs such as lithium or other mood stabilizers. Patients with delusions related to personality disorders may require comprehensive ongoing therapy to offset the effects that delusions have had on their personality. Often, the treatments for delusions of grandeur will focus on managing and reducing symptoms rather than curing the underlying condition. Depending on the cause, the patient with delusions may need to take medication or have long-term therapy to cope up with their symptoms throughout their lives. Helping a patient to understand how their delusions have a negative impact in their life or relationships, along with support and treatment, the patients with delusions can lead a peaceful life.
That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers. This is the end of this listening test.